and uh, I want to make sure that you all uh, see well. Do you see well there my presentation? Yes. Yes, I think Yeah. So, so let me tell you. Like, I know you you gave me a theme about um, endoscopic kinase for the third ventricle, and I thought about this talk. And there's, I think, for to talk about surgery, the, the the third ventricle is really the the main um, pathology is craniopharyngioma. They really allow us to talk about the rationale uh, and when we will go one way or the other endonasal or craniotomy for uh, third ventricle tumors because not everything should be done endonasal. I think that depend on the uh, uh, pathology. And so craniofrangioma really help us. So I decided to show a little bit about uh, what we, um, the way we think about craniofrangioma. In general, when we go endonasal, we really respect these co-base principles where we basically don't touch the brain and uh, go all the way into the uh, uh, base of the skull there and the uh, interpeduncular fossa, which is very important uh, in this area. There is difficulty to find another approach that gives you the uh, visualization of the interpeduncular fossa without touching the brain as the endonasal does. Very important principles of bimanual dissection. You shouldn't be doing anything inside the ventricle with only one hand uh, or even if it's supracellar uh, in the subarachnoid space. The um, ideal uh, approach, you have to have a good exposure so you can really uh, uh, visualize the structures to respect them. Respect the superior hypothesial arteries on the way uh, to the third ventricle is extremely important to preserve uh, vision and have vision good vision outcome. And um, it's also for the uh, identification of the stalk. The stalk becomes, the pituitary stalk becomes one of the landmarks that can take you to the third ventricle. So there's some tumors that expand the stalk and the tumor is inside the stalk and we then go following the tumor into the ventricle. And there are other tumors that will be behind the stalk or anterior to the stalk. And those are um, landmarks that we use, always respecting the stalk as, as possible, while always trying to preserve the pituitary function as well. And what, one of the advantages of coming endonasal on uh, approaches to this area, particularly tumors in the third ventricle, is the visualization, the visualization of the interface between tumor and the third ventricle. Because by looking at that interface, we know if the tumor is possible to resect or if it is a tumor that we need to leave a little bit behind in order to avoid damage to the hypothalamus. So the, the visualization coming from inferior is very helpful. And uh, a vascularized reconstruction is the way we always uh, perform reconstruction to avoid or at least decrease the chances of CSF leak. One thing that uh, I don't know, like uh, for you guys in, uh, in Turkey and other places, how is, how is that advancing? But craniopharyngiomas, papillifer, like a uh, papillary craniopharyngiomas, they they can have uh, uh, BRAF mutation, and they may be treated. Uh, particularly if they don't have calcification, you should have uh, uh, suspicious that they that could be the case, and uh, they can have uh, treatment by using BRAF inhibitors nowadays. So, in in general, though, all craniopharyngioma are going to try to resect completely. I was balancing what I just mentioned, you know, like a vision function, pituitary function, and a hypothalamic function. So you, you're going to be aggressive, but with with balance, uh, because that's that's what we need to do. And like I said, for BRAF inhibitors, so this is almost almost like uh, eight years that we have this publication, where uh, the uh, uh, Priscilla Brastianos from Boston showed the world that uh, craniopharyngiomas can really respond very well to medication BRAF inhibitors. So of course, it's only the papillary, not the adamantinomatous. So this is uh, this is why no calcification is one of the findings. Most of the papillary craniofrangiomas don't have calcification. So that's one of the findings. And uh, and, and and have this in mind is, is very important. I have now two patients that, uh, three patients that are treated with uh, papillary craniofrangioma with a more uh, would say uh, less aggressive surgery followed by BRAF inhibitors. In in general, for craniopharyngiomas here, so these are the main two ones, two types. Type two inside the stalk basically follows the stalk all the way into the third ventricle. 
So this is the, the, the type of cranial pharyngioma that you, you'll be looking for, for intraventricular surgery. And then there's what we call type four that are purely inside the third ventricle. And for those, that's when there's some situations that will come in the nasal, uh, but uh, I would either come transport or transcolosal or the, if it's purely uh, intra third ventricle there, there's also an option to come anteriorly translamina terminalis as well. So depend on the case. <laughs> and this is what I think is important that everybody sees that uh, depending on the, the way the tumor presents uh, is gonna be one type of uh, approach. Type one is in front of the stalk and type three is behind the stalk. We also name uh, type zero when it starts in the cella for a cranial pharyngioma. So they can start in the cella and push all the, the uh, content superiorly and they can look like they are inside the ventricle but they're actually pushing the floor of the ventricle sometimes, or just by following the stalk, by dilating the stalk all the way up there. Always important to see the position of the brainstem to try to understand where is the floor of the uh, of the um, uh, floor of the third ventricle. Uh, so I I came once uh, with a with a manuscript, very interesting. If you look at the brainstem, it looks like an eagle, like a bird, and this is the beak here, and the beak will point to the floor of the third ventricle. If the beak is pointing up, that means the floor is elevated. If the beak is pointing down here, that means it's just inside the third ventricle. That's very important uh, information that I've been using uh, to plan uh, surgery. So for type four, so, sorry, for type zero, where uh, the tumor is in the cella, we perform a direct endonasal approach with a resection of the tumor, similar to an approach that we will be doing to resect the pituitary adenoma. And this is the type of resection that we can have with type zero. Type one is in front of the cella, and I hope you can see the video well here. Very important to have two hands. Um, see, by main dissection, with my suction, I can retract the tumor, present the arachnoid uh, plane. And you can see here the respect of for the superior hypophysial arteries right there. Here's the chiasm, optic nerve on the left side, on the right side. And that type of dissection by manual, carefully, you can see that the tumor in this case is in front of the stalk. So it is a type one. And uh, we are freeing those branches of the superior hypophysial there. So very, uh, uh, very important. You see the uh, uh, my partner ENT uh, here. In this case, was uh, Dr. Otto. Really steady, holding the camera dynamically, so I can go back and forth. Uh, but this type of uh, dissection is very important. In this case here, I I cut the the tumor in two pieces, uh, cut the arachnoid, preserve the stalk, and. Uh, we were able to then uh, this divide into pieces and then cut the other part uh, to then resect that uh, completely. So here's the uh, the resection. This is the post-op. Uh, this patient did very well, didn't have diabetes insipidus, but did have a, a hyponatremia. So you have to be prepared every time you manipulate the stock like to deal with uh, either diabetes insipidus or hyponatremia. So other tumors here, sometimes it's difficult to tell, is this in the ventricle or not? And uh, and this is in the ventricle, but this is an interesting case because this is a type one uh, uh, cranial pharyngioma, meaning that was in front of the pituitary stalk. I couldn't tell before surgery, looking at these images, to me, looked like it was inside the ventricle there. Um, and um, here we'll show the video. It was not a very pneumatized uh, sphenoid. So for these, you have to really spend your time, drill drill well, uh, expose the uh, skull base. This is the cella. I like to find the cella first because it gives me the center of the exposure. And then here we're uh, opening the plenum and uh, a little bit of the, of the uh, tuberculum cella exposed as well. So here we, uh, for cranial pharyngioma, I always open the door of the cella and the supracellar in order to get full control of the superior intercavernous sinus that I coagulate and, uh, and transect. And then here you see the way I look for the stalk by uh, very early in the case is by lifting the tumor and, and trying to find where is it taken off from the pituitary gland. So I go very low first and I lift that arachnoid. I see some tumor trying to see if it's 
if it's suckable and it's very dense as typically. And here, when we lift the uh, arachnoid with, uh, with the tumor, we were able to identify the stalk right there under my suction uh, running behind there. And so grab off is on the sides as well. So this surgery was interesting because we uh, dissect between the stalk and the uh, optic nerves anteriorly. And you see the chiasm right there. I'm using a little bit of blunt dissection, debulking the tumor. And I created this plane all the way 360 around until it was free from the stalk and free from the optic nerve. And then I, I, I look at inside and it was, uh, was really free. And it was going in front of the stalk in between chiasm and the stalk all the way to the third ventricle. So this is a good example here that we follow the tumor. And then because it was free on the surrounding, then I basically, you know, I basically mobilized the free, the free component. And we can see these beautiful views of the ventricle from below. Let me put a little pause here because you can see here anterior commissure, you see the uh, the uh, for M. L. Monroe, you see the choroid plexus. On top of there, you see volunteer positive. So, and you can see that the walls of the hypothalamus is like uh, all doing well. At the base here, just a little bit of petechia from the contact with the tumor, mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, no uh, damage to the hypothalamus. Like, uh, and and this this is the, the way we do reconstruction. I try to create a plug with a collagen matrix, and then putting the flap here. This is the way uh, the, we put the flap and the vascularized to avoid any leakage. And here's some of the glue that we use. Uh, this is the post-op on this patient. Fam the, the patient did great. Uh, function was preserved. The uh, hypothalamus was going well. And about five years later, she came back with headache. And you see uh, even complete resection. Sometimes you see this. This is a five years later recurrence. And this is just to show like a, now it's attached to the interior cerebral arteries, is on top of the optic nerve, is, is, is more eccentric. So for these, I don't want to go back and do nasal and deal with the scar, and it's going to be very difficult. So for these, I'd rather them come with an open approach. So here, if you can see the video, this is an eyebrow approach, subfrontal, where we uh, open the arachnoid. And then here we're dissecting the uh, tumor on top of the optic nerve. You can see here the optic nerve on the right side. And all that recurrent tumor, even with MRIs every year, there was nothing growing. On the year five, boom, it grew very fast. So craniopharyngioma can be interesting. Um, here's dissecting from the optic. The way I do, I find the inner portion of the uh, optic, and then I follow the chiasm to find the contralateral optic. And this is what we did here, elevated in front of the chiasm, separated from the chiasm, and then the bolt. And here you see the uh, anterior cerebral arteries. We dissected and uh, separated tumor from the arteries as well. And this allowed us to get a, a, a very good resection for her. You can see here the optic nerves uh, on both sides with a complete resection via eyebrow. And here's the incision in the eyebrow, and this is closing the dura. So the eyebrow goes very well. I use that a lot as well. So for situations that I want to go less invasive uh, and avoid uh, uh, endonasal for reasons like this one where there's a lot of scar, then we can come with uh, with an eyebrow. This is the post-op for this patient. So now, lesions the type 2 where they basically dilate the stalk. And these are interesting. They can come like they can look like this, very thick. When you look at the stock, the stock is dilated. It's interesting. If you look at the literature, Yazar Gill's paper from like the 80s, there's a percentage of cases that he was not able to see the stock. And and they discuss and they talk about like uh, you know, why sometimes we don't see the stock. In my opinion, it are type twos. If you do craniotomy. If you don't recognize, you, you're going to call capsule. You're going to call it capsule of the tumor, but it's actually the stalk. And coming in endonasal allows us to split that stalk in the center. I'll show you how I do it. Here is another example where we uh, open the cella and open the supracellar space. <laughs> A lot of the thick arachnoid, as usual, looking for the stalk. And in this case, I can see that the stalk is very thick, as you can see there. So I do this incision in the middle. I just split the stalk in the middle and I open all the way down to the gland. 
And, and with this maneuver, I dissect the stalk from the tumor. As you can see, it's a very thin membrane. And inside is just tumor. Because this uh, dilated the, the stalk all the way to the third ventricle, we can follow uh, that, that disease into the third ventricle. And uh, very carefully, I debulk the book, but I know that I'm doing already surgery inside the third ventricle. The, the door to open is really the split of the stalk and the, uh, and the dissection that we do on the surroundings. We got to be very careful finding the plane. When I do this surgery, to me, it feels like I'm doing an acoustic surgery, like preserving the seventh nerve around. It feels the same. It's like all that, that thick tumor, uh, uh, and we have to find the plane. And in the bottom here, you have to be careful not to cut the, uh, the stalk against the, the tuberculum cell, as it can uh, cause diabetes insipidus as well. So here is the dissection, just show like a more advanced into the case. This was not a small tumor. So you can see the stalk is completely split. There's always more pieces. You look with the 45 degree endoscope, uh, keep taking tumor out. I uh, hear more tumor out and more tumor out until we were able to look inside the ventricle uh, at the end of the resection. And uh, there's a little clot. And then this is the first inspection that we did here. And then uh, and, and with a nice view of the uh, under surface here with a good resection, preserving this stalk. So this patient has partial function of the pituitary gland up to these days. There was one more piece here that we took it out at the end as well, as you can see, as a post-op. Uh, type threes are the lesions located behind uh, the uh, uh, pituitary stalk. And that's when I want you to pay attention on the brainstem. Uh, looking at the beak of the bird here. Is the beak push up or the beak pointing down? So if you're pointing up, that means the disease is in the interpeduncular fossa. Like in this case here, see the, the beak is pointing up. There's some invasion there. So difficult case, um, you know, when you have invasion near the, corp the mammillary bodies, it can be uh, problematic for the patient. This is one of the early cases that I uh, decided to do a, uh, uh, transposition of the gland bilaterally, but I want you to see the uh, pituitary gland. It, 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 this is the dorsum cellae upper part. So we took that dorsum cellae out, opened the uh, um, the dura posterior fossa, and then we um, debulk the tumor. You can see the third nerve down here. You can see then the, using the, 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 the vascularization. Down here, you see the basilar artery. Let me show you better down there. And with these, we, we were able to mobilize the tumor, always dissecting away from the third nerve and, and uh, posterior communicating artery, calcified tumor. And this can be difficult, as you can see, PCOM right there. And you don't want to dislodge your, you know, that calcified and avulse uh, the PCOM. So uh, it was, it's never easy. Um, but notice that the gland is getting a little darker. And that's, this is the last case I did a, a full transposition uh, because I felt that there was a venous stasis, venous congestion of the uh, pituitary gland at the end of the case. And, and my theory is that we are amputating the venous drainage when you do bilateral. And uh, for that reason, I started doing uh, just in one side. Uh, I call the hemi-transposition. So here is the removal of the uh, tumor reconstruction. And then uh, the way it looked like afterwards, like uh, she she did okay. She went to college and everything. However, she, after surgery, it was two days sleepy, probably of some massage uh, on little flare change on the hypothalamus, but she didn't have any flare, any uh, permanent damage. Um, so let me just show you like uh, how I do this for some of these uh, tumors. I, I do a hemitransposition. This is a case where I noticed the... Uh, uh, pituitary stalk that was pushed to the left side. This is a type one versus three is a little more posterior to the uh, pituitary there. The hypophyseal is pushed up. So I dissect the uh, superior hypophyseal and, and then I protected the superior hypophyseal superiorly there. But you can see here the tumor was going down. So I disconnect the gland from the right side. And this is the first time I did a, a, a hemitransposition. Uh, and that was, this is the case that showed me that it's nice and is a good way to preserve the venous drainage. In this case, it's draining to the left. 
and I was able to open the open the cell up and get that uh, tumor uh, away from the uh, the back of the pituitary gland there. And this is the hemitransposition that we've been doing now uh, more frequently. This is the way it looks like at the end. And uh, we did skeletonize the carotid on this side to be able to get all the way around. Uh, and you can see, you can really flip the gland and go around and you can remove the dorsum cell and keep going to the uh, posterior fossa if needed. This patient we've been following, no recurrence and, uh, and no uh, problems with, uh, with the um, function of the pituitary gland. Now, I'm gonna show you this uh, interesting case I did more recently. Um, this is a case uh, that it was supracellar, but initially when I look at this picture here, I was wondering if this was a pituitary adenoma because it was it's like homogeneous in the MRI. Had it was pushing the optic nerve uh, on the uh, right side up, but I wasn't sure is that a cyst is a. And um, on this case, then I approach. Let me show you here. I opened up and then I put an ultrasound. There's a nice technology that is available now. And when I put the ultrasound, I see this very heterogeneous. And uh, at this point, I had a, I had ex opened the tuberculum cellae space, the cella, but I thought with the ultrasound, if it looked like an adenoma, I'm gonna enter just the cella and try to follow the tumor up without causing a leakage. But since I saw that look like a craniopharyngioma, then I open like a craniopharyngioma opening where we open the cella, the tuberculum cellae, connected both sides, uh, ligate the superior intercavernous sinus, and then we are in the superior space there where we have the arachnoid. And this is another one that the stalk was pushed to the left. And it's very similar to that old case that I've done. And superior hypophysio is there. We dissect from the gland. Uh, by moving the arachnoid, you can move the superior hypophysio up. So that's what I do progressively. So I try to keep the superior hypophysio in contact with the optic nerve. And then I was able to roll the uh, lateral aspect of the tumor. Uh, back into the center. Um, just as a quick note here, you can see this maneuver with this man with this instrument here. This is the Angelina dissector that I designed. It has this curvature, so it doesn't touch the uh, optics of the uh, endoscope. And then uh, we were able to dissect and get this tumor out of that corner. It was insinuating at the floor of the third ventricle, but not completely inside the third ventricle in this case. And you can see the beautiful anatomy at the end here with the carotid artery, the anterior choroidal arteries, the pituitary stalk. And, uh, and then we were kind of treating there like uh, the, the last piece. This patient also had a hyponatremia. Let me show how I close these days. I put a plug. I create a plug of uh, uh, collagen uh, matrix like that. And then I put gel foam inside, like creating real plug. The gel foam expands. I call this the soft gasket seal. And then I rotated in like a real plug. And then I put the, the neuro, uh, vascularized flap on top of it. And this uh, does the work, um, you know, to, to get this under control. You can see how the flap sits nicely. Uh, frequently you see pneumocephalus, but this patient do uh, well so quickly. Now, large intraventricular tumors. Um, if, if you look at down here, coming in donation is not a good option because you have a very narrow space. You can enter here, but it will be very difficult to dissect all the way around. <clears throat> so I always uh, consider coming with a port surgery. Uh, you can do this endoscopically or with a microscope. I use a gut navigation and I cannulate with a small uh, craniotomy. And you basically land uh, on the upper part. This is the lateral ventricle. And then you can do a transcoroidal approach. You know, in this case here, we uh, then enter the uh, uh, lat th uh, third ventricle by, by dissecting progressively and going down uh, into the, uh, into the uh, uh, third ventricle. And you can see the craniopharyngioma from the top. It's not easy, but allows you to go around and the bow can go around and the bow can go around. And uh, by doing that, uh, you can uh, get very good resections coming from the top. I'll tell you like one of the issues I had by, by, by doing this type of surgery, transcortical, is that you come in down in an angle and the ipsilateral inferior corner is blind. 
So I don't like uh, as much. I did that early in my career. Now I'm coming for tumors like this. I come transcalosal. This is a, a patient that we uh, came with a transcalosal. If you look at down here, look at the narrow space. Optic chiasm is right there. Push down. Gland is here. To enter through this corner here and go all the way there, it's uh, unrealistic. So I come transcalosal in these cases. This one particularly, I should have done the craniotomy a little more posterior. Uh, I was touching the bone and touching the fornix, and I couldn't go more anterior to dissect this part. Decided to leave this behind because I couldn't see the chiasm from behind. And then I came endonasal to take just this piece because then it's, uh, it's uh, reasonable. So I complement this with an endonasal approach and got a complete resection. This patient never had radiations more than six, seven years out. He's totally normal with the exception of panhypopituitarism that he had already before surgery. So this, his vision is absolutely normal. His mind is normal. He's working. So this was a good approach for him respecting the walls of the hypothalamus. So these are just some, some of these flavors of different cases. The majority of craniopharyngiomas will perform endonasal approach as the uh, uh, best corridor to reach these tumors. You see here several different flavors of type 1, 2, 3, and some of them like type 4. And these are all Indonesian examples of uh, resections. I want to finish showing this case because I think it's the future and it's very important you see this. This is a doctor who came to me with a lesion that looked like a craniopharyngioma. Very small space down here. I, I, and his pituitary function was normal, normal in a doctor. So I felt if I would go through the endonasal, I might damage the stalk. I don't know if I can do much. So I decided to come with a craniotomy. I opened lamina terminalis, uh, as you can see here, the, the optic exposure. And, uh, and I came then inside the, the, the ventricle with an endoscope, but this time from the top. So as you can see here, we freed up some of the adhesions. And then uh, here I came with the, endo, with the endoscope. Uh, the, and this is the lamina terminalis. Uh, I had a little retractor there to facilitate it's not easy to go all the way there, but uh, this is the inspection with the endoscope coming from the top. Uh, I decided to stop and leave the disease that was behind and low. As you can see here, this is what I left behind. I left a lot of disease behind uh, at the floor of the third ventricle because his pituitary function was normal once again. And he had no calcification in the preoperative MRI. This is why I did this less, less aggressive resection. And uh, after uh, confirmation that this was a uh, BRAF uh, papillary craniopharyngioma, we start BRAF inhibitors. And this is the imaging now. He's out three years already. He did BRAF inhibitors for one year and stopped. Never had radiation. Everything disappeared. And his function is partially preserved. His, he has uh, hypopituitarism, but uh, not complete. Uh, he still has some function of the pituitary gland. So these are some of the uh, numbers. I think uh, it's important that you see from uh, uh, meta-analysis from the past that uh, the comparison because between endoscopic and microscope show the, uh, um, uh, if you see here, um, the um, a tendency for a better resection uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, endoscope or transphenoidal microscopic. Uh, but in general here, uh, if I show you the uh, DI, for instance, is much more commonly present in attempts uh, with a with an open craniotomy versus the uh, DI that is permanent with the transphenoidal with the microscope or endoscope, just because of the angle of visualization. However, leakage is much worse nowadays with the endoscope. Like the literature here earlier in the last 20 years showed almost like it could be about 20%. I think this is because of the old numbers, early series. Uh, in our practice, I quote around uh, less than one in 10. So if I come up with a patient, I tell the patient the ch chance of going back to the operating room with a leak by going, going through the nose is, is less than one in 10. In, in reality, I think it, we published recently is around 6% nowadays in our hands here with our team. Uh, vision is also tend to improve uh, with the endonasal approach. So um, I want to then uh, finalize with this picture because really a nice summary of what we talked about, type 1s in front of the infundibulum and type 3 behind, 
type two is a nice way to get into the third ventricle by following the tumor, splitting the stock. And then uh, type fours is when we would do either terms lamina terminalis or uh, transcortical or transcalosal. And uh, I'd like to invite you, uh, we still have some availability for those that wanna come all the way here. Ohio spent three days with us. We have a hands-on course with uh, uh, some didactics as well. And uh, appreciate the invitation and uh, letting me uh, uh, talk to you guys. And I'll be happy to answer any question. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you have shown excellent case examples. It was like an endoscopic skull based festival. Thanks for your detailed uh, presentation. And Thank all you. My... Uh, professors uh, from Turkey and uh, that are among us now and uh, their opinions I wonder um, first of all we can ask Professor Hakan Karabal whether he has uh, any contribution if he's still online uh, can you hear me yes very well yes. thank you very much Dr. Daniel, uh, it was very nice presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, since these are major surgeries and benign pathologies, it is necessary to be very careful. Uh, it is uh, of great importance that we know we where to stand, especially in the pediatric craniopharyngiomas. I am curious about the features of the neuroendoscope you use. Secondly, are you using CUSA in this approach? Uh, approach? Uh, thirdly, uh, what treatment method do you follow for intense postoperative pneumocephalus? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah let, let me uh, try to answer all of them. Very good questions. Um, so, of course, I agree. We have, we have to be very delicate uh, with, this, with this surgery. As you as that's what I tried to show in my presentation, the carefulness with the superior hypophysial arteries, the uh, neurovascular structures. Um, pediatric is a uh, is challenge. Uh, sometimes, because in pediatric, you will see no pneumatization of the sphenoid frequently. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to balance if you're going to go endonasal or not. The other characteristic in pediatric is the opening here, the aperture. If it is, if you should, you shouldn't always measure. If it's less than 17 millimeters in a CAT scan, you measure, right, at the aperture. If it's less than 17 millimeters, I'll tell you, don't go endonasal. Then it is going to be a struggle. And that you're usually finding kids less than two years old. Then it's better to create yourself a space with a craniotomy, go from the top, by corona, whatever you need to do. But uh, that that's uh, I agree one very important characteristic there. Um, the uh, CUSA, it's uh, I don't use much. I think you saw in my presentation a device that aspirates and cuts. Um, I don't have any relationship with them. It's called the Myriad Nico device. Uh, Nico Myriad device aspirates and cuts and uh, has a little guillotine on the tip, and it allows you to shave the tumor progressively. The reason I like that better than a ultrasonic aspirator is because just for this type of approach, because we are using an endoscope and the endoscope is 2D. And when I have an instrument going straight is a little difficult to understand 100% the depth of that tip. Yeah. And cutting on the side is more is safer because I can see uh, where is it cutting. So I turn it away from the... Uh, structure like a nerve like I showed and then I cut laterally and every time I try to use a uh, ultrasonic I do use but for large tumor like meningioma I, I may use it when it's extremely large and I want to debulk quickly um, but not for this area because I'm always worried that I'm too deep and not understanding the tip of the uh, of the instrument and I think you had one more question what was it sir about the pneumocephalus post-operative oh pneumocephalus. yeah and the pneumocephalus, um, we see frequently, rarely is uh, tension. 
Uh, I always put the patient on 100% oxygen uh, to, to help uh, to reduce quickly. I also monitor the size of this pneumocephalus. Let's say if we put a lumbar drain, if you see getting bigger after surgery, that means you have a gap. That means that you have a leak. So if it gets bigger, I take the patients back to the operating room to repair. And I had two cases that I actually evacuate a tense pneumocephalus. And, and that, that happens when I, uh, it's like a valve mechanism. I had a small dural defect that was leaking through the surgery while my ENT team was doing a reconstruction, uh, harvesting tissue from the side of the head. And we left that leakage for more than an hour. I think it was about an hour. And when we reconstruct, everything looked good, but the patient didn't wake up. And I did a CT, it was terrible. It was like a tense pneumocephalus with a zebra posterior fossa with bleeding. I Then I did a, a burr hole, put a, a catheter on the subdural space and exchange it with fluid, get the air out, and the patient woke up. Um, so you have to be very vigilant. So my, my message about that is for any time of the surgery that you're uh, doing something else and there is a leak, try to cover it up, put a little Duragen gel form, you know, while you cover that, don't let it leak, 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 because you can also have subdural hematomas. Uh, if you get an older person and you get leak, 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 leak during surgery, you want to make sure that you plug those while you're doing something else. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a little question about the uh, uh, CSF fistula. Did you use the intra uh, abdominal fats? Yeah, not all the time. Uh, as you saw in my videos, I, I try to avoid, particularly intracranially, because uh, fat intracranially causes uh, artifact and uh, MRI afterwards, I don't like much, enhances, cause problems. So I use most of the time in the sphenoid sinus, help the flap. So I will put it in the sphenoid sinus and then I'll bring the flap, the pedicle touching the fat and then the, and then the flap covers the scobes defect, uh, but, but almost never inside the defect or intracranially. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And a colleague from Georgia stated that she wants to share a case. If we nice. give permission for Sikishe, she will ask her question to Professor I'll try. First of all, I'd like to uh, express my sincere gratitude for the uh, spectacular wow. lecture with the demonstration of the uh, unique cases. Thank you very much for sharing your insight and experience. Uh, I will try to share, like, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm from my phone. Um, uh, while I try to share it, I'm going to ask first part of my question. Um, especially in pediatric cases, what drives your the process of decision making, whether you will choose the uh, transcolosal and transcranial route or endoscopic route? Is it the size of the tumor? Is it the location of the tumor? Or uh, in case of pediatric, you mentioned already the indications and contraindications, but yeah, I think he's muted. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. I'm sorry. I cannot unmute myself. I think uh, <laughs> they need to do for me. Um. Uh, the uh, yeah. I think the the it's a it's a very good question because it's what we all uh, think about these cases when to do one or the other. So. I'm going to repeat some of the important things. I think for ch children, I, I mentioned the size of the nose and pneumatization of the sphenoid sinus. I think for other tumors is really the position of the chiasm and the position of the pituitary stalk. If it's too tight in the front, I may come with the craniotomy from the top. I also look at the anterior cerebral artery. If it's highly positioned, lower position, allowing us to go easily through the uh, uh, lumina terminalis or not. Uh, so those are, are some of the criteria. Size is not as much, mainly location, mainly location, Madonna. Uh, I think if you if you have, for instance, a tumor that is, uh, I have some of those, going to the sylvian fissure, um, you may consider, sometimes they bubble cysts and things like that. You may consider a, a lateral craniotomy instead of coming from the top. Uh, inside the ventricle, uh, I think the best approaches are, are, are to consider as endonasal, translaminal terminalis, and transcalosal, and in some situations, a transcortical, transcoronal, transcoroidal as well. Um, 
Uh, those are, but, but mainly location and how it distorts the position of the normal anatomy is, is really the, the, the way I look into this every time. Thank you so much. And as for the case, yesterday we had a four-year-old child with the giant cranium uh, pharyngioma. I shared the preoperative MRI and CT scan. You see the calcification on CT and MRI. You see the compression uh, and occlusion of the th third ventricle. Uh, he presented in other hospital in West Georgia with a uh, hypertensive crisis with the Increased intracranial pressure, all the symptoms of occlusion, hydrocephalus. He was operated emergency. He had an emergency third ventricular ostomy and uh, endoscopical biopsy of the tumor, and he was transport was transported to our hospital. And yesterday we performed the major surgery with transcolosal interhemispheric approach. I only have a post op CT. Um, like we managed to take out um, uh, everything from the third ventricle. However, we uh, couldn't manage to um, reach the, the proportion of the tumor, as you can see in the CT. Uh, and the pa patient is now complaining about the um, vision. Uh, vision is worse than before the surgery in the left eye. Uh, my question is, how often do you have like worsening of the vision after the surgery uh, in the like a couple of uh, first days? And how often is it's a transitory or is it permanent? What, what is your experience? Uh, no, 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 no. Very good question. Uh, I think we all lose part of our lives every time that happens, right? You see, a, you do a surgery, beautiful, go there, see the patient, the patient is worse. I always tell the patients and um, families when the function is already low, like if, then how can I explain? If it is a very uh, severe blood vision loss, or severe hearing loss in neurosurgery, everything that is already compromised substantially, those are high, high risk for us to go there, try to help and make it worse because those nerves are already beat up, right? Those nerves are already uh, very sensitive and already not healthy. So I'll tell you a story very fast about a, a lady that I did uh, several years ago that I, I was so nervous. And I know you're nervous right now because your patient has vision worse. And this lady had a craniotomy before by my partner for a craniopharyngioma. And um, there's, there was six months later, a recurrence, like in the, the interpeduncular fossa. So I came in the nasal, but when I opened up, the optic nerve had healed down and there was tumor on top of the optic. And I was like, oh my God, I, I had to kind of manipulate the optic a little bit to go behind and get the tumor out. So I was able to get the tumor out and uh, I manipulate the nerve just a little more than usual. And uh, she was already with a low vision on the other side. So this lady woke up blind, both eyes, completely blind, completely blind. She couldn't see anything. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do? I heard this patient and... Uh, I couldn't sleep for three days. I was like, oh my God. And I was like, you will come back or will not come back. So I'll tell you that this lady by day five starts seeing light. By day six, seven, it starts seeing a little better. By two, three weeks, she was seeing better than before surgery. So uh -huh. there's always hope, okay? There's always hope. Of course, um, I was always worried about ischemia, vasospasm, things like that. Um, you know, so, but the fact that it's worse to then get better, we see that a lot in neurosurgery um, from manipulation. I, I would not uh, completely believe or, or be too worried that, uh, you know, if you feel that the surgery was, there was no ischemia, no vessel in the area, particularly coming from the transcalosal, you dissect it nicely and the nerve is preserved, you, sh you should, you should uh, get some improvement in the next few days or uh, weeks. One thing that I tell patients all the time, time about vision as well uh the when they let's say they don't get worse but they start getting better and they have like a very severe deficit uh there's data that shows the improvement happens all the way to two years after surgery after so only after two years from a decompression that you declare that the vision will not get better anymore so this there's ophthalmology uh papers showing patients that got decompressed and they do visual fields they do visual fields and um only after two years, there's no more improvement. So there's a lot of time for waiting on these and, and let it get better. 
Thank you so much. This was truly inspirational story and, and uh, case. And I hope my patient has the same fate. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your contribution. And I can see uh, Associate Professor Michel I'm one of the participants on the screen. I'm curious about his contributions too. If we can uh -huh. unmute the microphone. Good. Thank you uh, uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, I want to ask two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you often uh, use uh, intraoperative ultrasound? Not ultrasonic aspirator directly. I know you use uh, once uh, uh, in a pituitary symposium, you have shown us uh, in Istanbul pituitary uh, days, uh, very beautiful cases. Uh, but how do you often, uh, is it uh, okay to use it with the craniopharyngeal transnasal approach? And my second question is, uh, how do you deal with, uh, again, uh, uh, a hypothalamic uh, storm? Uh, do you s often see it or uh, how do you respond to that hard, qu uh, hard situation? Um, yeah, very, very good. Uh, very good questions. Um, let me uh, just very fast here, see if I can show you one thing. Um, where, like, uh, if you uh, allow me, I'll share uh, my screen here. So I, I've been trying to, are you seeing my screen or no? No, not yes. yet. Coming. Wait a sec. How about now? Mm, I don't know. I'm having a problem here. Let me see if I close this. Um, I'll try one more time. If not, then it's okay. Now, do you see? Yes. It's okay, yeah. Um, so, let me... Uh, I try to use every time uh, to answer your question. And the main reason is because I'm learning as well. So this is another one here. I don't know why I cannot uh, do the... Maybe if I make it bigger. Oh, here we go. Um, so, so this is another example. See, this is another cranial frame drum. I'm using all the time. This is just another example here. Uh, Hussein, how do you say your name? Hussein? Uh, you can say Hass. Say Hass? Yeah, okay, it's okay. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, but, but, but the beauty is that you don't need intraoperative MRI for most of these cases. If you have a nice exposure, look at this pre-op MRI. And then during surgery, look exactly the same. I see the nodule on the wall, see there? I see this is the surface here, and I see the nodule. And then at the end, I took the nodule out and I compare, and the nodule is gone. And then it was it was great. Uh, I, I'm using it all the time. You know, this doesn't cost more, right? So once I um, once I uh, you purchase this ultrasound, you just re-sterilize and, and you just use it again and again. So I open the Dura, and now I use it all the time. I'm learning as well. So by doing that, I'm getting more experience to understand and read how the interpretation of these uh, ultrasounds, because it's a new thing. There's a learning curve. Initially, I was like, I lost, what is this? And now, now I'm like, oh, okay, this is this, this is that. So it, it works very well. And uh, you had another question? Uh, hypothalamic storm. Yeah, those are, uh, I try to avoid them, right? But they do happen once in a while. Um, I don't have a secret, uh, really keeping the patient in the ICU. I had in my career several times patient is shaking and temperature is rising and, and you know, like, what do you do? So it's really ICU and, and try to, uh, you know, treat everything that is happening, you know, like uh, treat the, the pressure, the temperature, things like that. There, I don't have a a full secret. Uh, I use steroids, you know, try to make sure they have full replacement. Watch the sodium, which is the more important because for sodium is where they can die. Uh, so they can change the sodium very fast, very fast. So uh, for craniofarangioma nowadays, I do every two hours after surgery for the first day at least. 
Every two hours, check the sodium. Two hours, check the sodium. Because if you do four or six hours, sometimes you do, and it's 149, the next one is 162 when the patient's in coma. Uh, so so I, I'm aggressive. So every time I go and work on this current frangioma, I, I do every two hours sodium. I check the specific gravity and everything, very aggressive sodium checks. And, uh, and then be on top of that. Uh, I, uh, doing DDAVP whenever necessary. Um, yeah, I mean, basically just medical care. Like I don't, I don't have any secret. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I have seen Professor Lantus among us. I'm curious about his contributions to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, um, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, talking you to us. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm very late uh, to join this uh, conversation. Uh, it's because you're at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was working, I'm in the clinic now. And uh, then uh, after my last patient, uh, I joined the uh, conversation. But uh, I, 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 uh, I agree with you. The, Hypothalamic, uh, for the hypothalamic uh, crisis, sodium is very important. Uh, very close screening is very important. Uh, for the, uh, other, there was another, another uh, question for the vision loss. Uh, and uh, when I was in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, we made uh, a study and uh, we have presented several times. Uh, in the pituitary surgery, I have uh, worked on uh, vision uh, problems of the patients. And uh, I found that 98% of the patients are uh, getting better following the pituitary surgery uh, for uh, uh, pituitary adenomas uh, and for other kinds of uh, optic chiasm uh, pressure. So 98% getting better. 1% is uh, continued in the same uh, level of uh, vision loss, one person is getting worse. Uh, so uh, pituitary surgery uh, is very promising uh, for vision loss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bullen. Like always, uh, great to see you. Um, for those that don't know, me and Bullen were together in Pittsburgh in the 2007. When was that, Bullen? 2007. Yeah, it's yeah, 2006. 2006, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was a great partner there. We did a lot of studies together. And um, I agree with you with the with the optics um, and vision improvement and all that. It is more complex for craniofaryngioma and meningiomas. I, I don't think the same amount of patients get better. I think firm tumors like meningiomas, when they're solid, you decompress, not necessarily patients will get back, uh, improve because I think their sperm tumors, they cause more damage, I think, uh, by, by sandwiching the optic nerve between the anterior cerebral artery and the tumor itself. So I think it causes like a cut on the nerve there. I've seen this several times coming in the nasal. Small anterior cerebral arteries, the small A1 is worse because there's more pressure on the nerve uh, coming from the other side as the tumor grows. I think it, the large anterior cerebral arteries, less chance of losing vision. But that's my theory. I I, I don't have a proof about it. Um, but I agree with you. Um, and I'll tell you one more thing that I think is important, Bulin, for all of you, you guys. You do a lot of pituitaries. Um, I start um, more and more at uh, the end of uh, pituitary surgery, putting gel foam or, or Duragen matrix inside the cavity to keep the diaphragma up. Because I think that 1% you told us that get worse, it's uh, CSF pushing the diaphragma down, the stock gets traction, and the optic nerve gets traction as well down. And they may get even worse uh, with the herniation of the diaphragma down into the sphenoid sinus. So uh, I know some people just take the tumor out and leave. I, I really now I'm pushing up, pushing up all the, uh, the, the, the diaphragma up again. I think that reduces the uh, chances for diabetes insipidus permanent by stretch of the stock and also vision. Uh, can I tell you a quick quick story? 
<clears throat> um, Dr. Labib called me once and uh, he, he called me with a patient that had a pituitary surgery and lost vision after surgery. And he said, Danny, I, I didn't even touch the optic nerves, but the patient is worse. And I asked him like, uh, and he didn't put anything in the cell. I said like, man, I think it's retraction. Go back and just put stuff, just put gel foam. And he called me crying the next day because his patient was seeing again. He took back to the operating room. He just put gel foam, pushed the diaphragm up and the patient could see again. So I think that 1% could be related to that particularly if you don't go to the subarachnoid space. So have that in mind. And I recommend putting gel foam or any other cheap material or surgical cell, something that will push the diaphragm up again. Thank you, Professor. Uh, as far as I can see, there isn't any question in the chat part. Uh, I give the turn to Professor Kami Suju for closing speech. Oh, and Professor Picharolo, um, same uh, I just want I just want to add something. Uh, I I have uh, uh, listened uh, Professor uh, Prevedello one and a half year ago, and uh, he said this uh, gel foam uh, technique uh, in order to uh, have a uh, to prevent the uh, uh, chiasm uh, fall. So I'm routinely uh, doing that technique uh, in my cases. Uh, and uh, thanks to Professor, uh, it, it's very okay now. Thank you very much. Happy, happy to get help, uh, uh, Doctor Bishereglu. Now, now yeah. is better. Huh? <laughs> now it's, uh, I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, this is for me is more important than anything. When I hear uh, that you that I was able to not only help my patients but help your patients as well. So that's for me is uh, more important. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I give the turn, Professor Camus. Uh, I want to thank again to Professor Prevedello. This is the second time we have him. And uh, it was an, another excellent lecture. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good evening there. Thank you so much.